Welcome to this week's episode of the Success Realtor Podcast by yours truly, Colleen Wood. Here is where we celebrate success in real estate and share the wisdom and struggles so that others can be successful too. If you're a new listener, I'm the producing branch manager of the Wood team at Hometown Lenders, and I'm known for helping realtors earn a lot more money in commissions without selling their soul to the industry and while maintaining balance with what's most important in life. I am so excited today to be talking to the amazing Jackie Larang, broker with Heavenly Homes out of Billings, Montana. She's a veteran. She's a mama, a wife, an investor, and an incredibly humble, down-to-earth, super successful real estate broker. Jackie, I am so glad you were able to join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I feel super honored because you guys are just powerhouses in it. Don't feel worthy. Oh, well, you definitely, definitely, definitely are. And you guys, this is a busy lady. She's got a lot on her plate. So I'm really excited that she took some time for us today. So we'll just dive right in. Give us a backstory, Jackie. Who are you? Tell us about where you came from, your military career, and how you got to be a realtor. Okay, yeah. So uh, born and raised in Montana and Montana girl at heart, for sure. I love the mountains, adventures, all that kind of stuff. So I did go Billings, Montana. And then I joined the military right out of high school because I wanted to be a firefighter since through high school, but college in Billings just felt like high school 2.0 and I was ready for some adventure. So kind of on a whim, which is kind of how I do a lot of things. I ended up joining the army as a firefighter to get some of that training and whatnot. And I loved it. I love being a firefighter. Came back here kind of between basic AIT, ended up meeting my now husband, we got engaged and uh, ended up deploying to Iraq. We were gone for almost a year and a half. So it was really hard to be apart. Obviously we're, you know, head over heels engaged. And uh, so one of the ways we connected, and I don't know why, but was through like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and not just the main book. We read all the like side series and just kind of both got excited about real estate in that time that I was away. So actually he ended up getting the opportunity to build a house not far from the house he grew up in, bought a piece of land and started building while we were deployed. So we were like, I think 22 at the time. And this was in 2003, 2004. I think we closed 2005. So this would have been 2004. And uh, they were giving away money and they were letting 22 year old kids with very little construction experience build. He was his own general. His dad's done dirt work and it just kind of was a perfect start. My uncle was a pretty big general at the time and he held his hand a little bit, but really my husband's just really good at figuring that stuff out. And he did, and he built a house. It was almost done when I got back in November. So I didn't get a job right away. I kind of got to do all the finish work, put floors down and paint. And that was really cool. And we were both just so excited about real estate at the time. And it was kind of during the boom. So there was a lot going on. So I got back in November We got married in December. We closed on the house right about the same time. And I went back to school to finish my fire science degree. And during spring break, I probably through one of the rich dad, poor dad books, I got the advice to get my real estate license. So Mm -hmm. over the spring break, I ended up getting my real estate license and started to fall in love with it, but did not think I was going to do sales. My parents were both in sales. I hated sales. It was bleh. So I got my fire science degree and then I got hired on the Billings Fire Department, which was goals. It was my dream, along with two of my buddies that I deployed to Iraq with. So cool. But then I think two weeks later, we got a phone call that there was a lawsuit through the city. So they oh. unhired us. Oh. And at the time it was such a gut punch, but I was also falling in love with real estate and kind of wanted to do it part-time while I was a firefighter. And it was just such a like, what do you call it? Like serendipitous, but it was like, you know what? I don't want to be part of, I kind of, as much as I love the military, I hate like big corporate, big business, yeah. that kind of like the, ugh. like, so, and the fire department is very government. It's the same as the military. A lot of those loopholes are, you know, jumping through things. And I hated that part of it. So I decided, you know what? I want to work for myself. So I went full speed ahead into real estate and like the rest is history. I just fell in love with it. It was meant to be, I miss firefighting, but that was, you know, the schedule and everything else. Real estate is just too perfect for me. So that was, I think 16 years ago. And as soon as we could, we used the equity in our home to start investing in real estate. So we've been investing in real estate for almost the same 
amount of time. And it's just, it's perfect. I've raised my kids being a realtor and I wouldn't have picked a better career for myself. I don't think so. Oh my goodness. What a tremendous yeah. success story. Well, thanks. Yeah. That's... It's been a ride. <laughs> it's been fun. You know, it seems like, you know, before success is a failure that is just an absolute gut punch. And yeah, yeah. you know, I getting excited about the failures and I certainly have had my own set of failures <laughs> that just took me to my knees. So yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. So if you were to start over, what would you have done differently if you were just to begin again? You know, I don't, I don't know that I would do anything different. I feel like we lucked out in so many ways. I mean, building a house in 2004 when we, I don't know if there's any other time in history that we would have been able to do what we did with what we had. I mean, we didn't have money. We didn't have, you know, <laughs> anything like that. It was just the way it worked. It was a wild time. Um, yeah. And I think we've been able to, what they call that when, you know, luck is when hard work meets opportunity. And I feel like we have just rode that wave mm. um, for the last few years. Not that, you know, whatever, but we've just kind of been in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And yeah. And it's just been, I'm thankful for it. Yeah. I don't think I would have done things differently. That's incredible. So what has been your most satisfying moment in your business? You know, I don't know that there's a moment, but there's been a few aha moments where I feel like, you know, people have told me when I got into real estate that about, you know, three years in is when, you know, most people get out by three years. And yeah. It was, there was a big turning point at three years when it was kind of like, okay, like I can actually do this. I kind of know what I'm doing. I think it was like probably around five to seven years when I was like, oh, like I'm not pretending anymore. Like I'm a realtor. Like people come to me and ask me questions <laughs> and I actually know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think about that same time as when I finally felt like I still have to try, obviously you still have to work, you still have to improve, yeah. but it was like, okay, like this isn't tenuous. This is my thing. Now I'm a realtor and I can do this for the rest of my life. And as long as I keep doing what I'm doing, I think I'm going to be okay. And it felt yeah. like just kind of a huge weight off your shoulders. Just be like, okay, like I, I can do this. Like I'm a real thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Pushing through that being the new guy is just so important. And I think that that's, you know, with both sides of our transaction, whether it's, you know, my side or your side, it's just, you know, I tell new people that are getting into lending, it's like, it's going to take a while yeah. for you yeah. to garner a reputation of being able to get things done. And you're going to mm -hmm. have a black eye just because you're new. And the only way <laughs> to make it through that is to have experience and close transactions, successful transactions over yeah. and over again. Yeah. At some point you don't feel like you're begging your friends and family to use you. You They come to you <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. I'm legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. And it's so true. So Jackie, you have such a heart for veterans. What is it that you do to support their home ownership? You know, I just, I'm not like an anxious or a worrier. I just kind of like the way I just jumped into firefighting and real estate. Like I'm just not anxious. And so I think one of the things I really try to do is it's taken me a long time to learn, to understand where people are coming through with their anxiety and their fears and stuff like that. Obviously I yeah. have some, I hate talking on social media. There's one, <laughs> like, but I feel like one of my biggest strengths is calming people down, yeah. you know, taking their hand and just one step at a time and just kind of easing people through when they're first time home buyers or veteran buyers and say, you can do this. Like, mm -hmm. let's just go talk to a lender. Let's just go mm -hmm. look at a house. Let's just, you know, you're not going to have to do anything, but just hang out with me for the next you know, however long it takes, and then we'll buy a house. So I think yeah. that's one of the biggest things and just understanding, especially veterans where some of the insecurities and the fears and stuff comes from, and just kind of, I don't know, holding their hand figuratively and literally sometimes, you know, literally. So yeah. Yeah. And then also just, you know, at the end of the day, a veteran buyer is not much different than an FHA buyer, or even a conventional buyer, especially, you know, somebody that hasn't bought a home in several years or whatever. So Mm -hmm. Um, and just kind of making sure they know, like, you're not different. You can do this. You know, we're all kind of figuring the same thing out. So, yeah, you know, I hear every day that VA financing is harder and costs the seller more money. In fact, I've even heard of realtors leaning away from a VA offer, which makes me a little crazy. Yeah. It, it makes is. me it's... a little crazy. Yeah. And, you know, my response to that is, 
we need to do everything in our power to help our veterans be able to take advantage of the benefit that they've earned. And, you know, so what do you say to that when you hear people say that? Well, I mean, in my research of VA loans, I've actually found, and in my experience, I found that VA loans are actually more likely to make it to the closing table. They have easier requirements, credit scores, down payments, that kind of stuff. So as far as the buyer goes, once the buyer has been approved, they're usually pretty solid. And especially if I can get like the guarantee that you offer that says, Hey, like this buyer is actually way more well approved and in a better position than most of your other offers, even your conventional are going to have a lot more. What ifs at the end of the day that are dependent on them and not the appraiser. And I think a lot of the issues were, especially when I first got in, I think the appraisals for a VA versus an FHA and a conventional There were more issues when it came to VA loans, but in my experience, that gap has closed and conventional have gotten strict about certain things and FHA and VA have loosened up on certain things to the point where I always tell people it's kind of a gamble. It depends on a lot of ways, what appraiser you get, what kind of day they're having and what they see. So really, unless, and if somebody says that to me, it's like, well, what are you worried about, you know, being an issue on this appraisal? Because if you're worried about it for me, you probably should be worried about it for every other buyer that's going to come to your door. So let's work through that. And, you know, maybe my client will be more willing to work through that with you since we're going to acknowledge it up front instead of trying to catch it on the backside. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've honestly had great luck once I counsel other realtors and just say, Hey, do you know that VA loans are actually more likely to get from offer to closing? Like these are great buyers and we need to, and then you just kind of always, you know, fair housing, of course, but you got to sell your buyers and you got to say, mm-hmm. these guys are really well approved. And I feel like something that comes with being in the industry for a long time is other realtors trust you. They say, yeah. okay, if Jackie says this buyer's solid, I believe her because she's closed the last 10 deals with me or whatever it is, you right. know? So all those kind of things combined to where I do like to see if a VA buyer can have a conventional option. And that's something I kind of tell them sometimes that, Hey, talk to your lender. If VA is going to be an appraiser or VA is going to be an issue with this seller, you know, whoever we end up with, maybe see what your options are conventional so -hmm. that we can say, okay, Hey, we are willing to work this route because they love this house. But for the most part, I think VA loans are just as great of an option for, you know, buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. I closed a VA loan a few years back at a 66% debt to income ratio. Holy cow. And it was because their mortgage, their new mortgage was really going to be the only debt that they had. So they had a ton of residual income and, you know, they didn't have a big family. It was a single guy. So the amount of residual income that VA required that he had was pretty low. And so, yeah, I was able to close at 66% and it was a game changer for him. And, you know, Montana veterans home loan, you know, offers a super low interest rate to Montana residents that are veterans, including national guard. Yeah. Even if they don't have like VA eligibility as in your typical factor, you know, Montana Veterans Home Loan will allow them to get a reduced interest rate, which right now is currently, I think it's at four and a quarter or four yeah. and a half. I closed one one time at 1.75%. On wow. That contract. I mean, it's amazing. I have a transaction right now that's live that was coming in with a VA loan and with a Montana Board of Housing match with it. And I ended up calling the listing agent and saying, hey, if there is an issue with the property, would you allow, once we are through underwriting with everything except for the property and we're through appraisal and the value is good, would you allow the buyer to come in and you know, paint your fence if that's something that's necessary Yeah. or, you know, would you allow a window to be replaced if it was necessary sure. for your home once we we're completely done and yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. We could do that. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, I think we can probably put this together. If, right. If, yeah. You know, if we'll and all just put our heads together. Yeah. And that's where it's so important to work with a lender who knows, I mean, VA is kind of the same as any other loan, but there are some little quirks and weird things. Like we've run into like a road issue, road maintenance issue before and yep. having a lender who will go to bat and read the regulations and find a way. And we were able to, we were able to kind of, you know, use some creative verbiage and everybody was okay with it. It's just like, this is the box you want us to check. We'll check it. We just got to mm-hmm. figure out how to do it in a way that works and having somebody like a lender like you that will just go to bat and keep working through it and not just say, well, the road maintenance agreement doesn't work. So we're going to 
Yeah. You know, dead deal. You got the door. Yep. Dead yep. deal. So. No, no, we can't do that. And, you know, VA and FHA and rural development will also call out things like, cause in Montana, we have, you know, springtime is the dog poop season when, you know, the <laughs> snow melts and all the dog poop shows yeah. up in the yard yeah. and VA will consider that to be a health concern. Oh, I have um, never been to that. <laughs> I have had that happen before. Oh, you know, gosh. so here, this realtor and I were out at this house. We didn't own <laughs> Cleaning up dog poop, you know. Oh, that sounds like, like what real estate in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you just got to do uh, what you got to do, and I think that that's you know, just like you said, consistent closed transactions is what changes the misconception in the market. Sure. I feel like there's a lot of black eyes and bruises for people that didn't do a great job. So I think that that's yeah. where that misconception comes from. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So renovation is a humongous part of your expertise since you and your hubby have done so much of your investment and being able to add it to your portfolio. What do you look for in a potential flip home or an investment home? Yeah. Well, I think one of my other favorite people to work with, but it's a love hate because investors are, they're difficult. They can be. So I'm very particular, but when I find, you know, a young couple that I love to counsel and get them excited about real estate, the way that we we're able to get excited about real estate. And one of the things I always tell them is like, you know, there's not one way to do it. There's not one, you know, some people make so much money being, you know, slumlords, I guess you could say, you know, finding high cash flowing properties and they don't have to be slumlords. They're just, you know, lower income, high cash flowing properties. We have gone another route where cash flow has not been our priority, but long-term maintenance and ease of ownership has been our number one priority because so my husband and I, we also partnered with my brother and sister-in-law and we do the renovation, the building, the renting, and we hold long-term. And so having done that for, I think, what to say, 15 years now, we've seen it go full cycle and we understand what a problem when you're looking at a house to buy, how that's going to translate in 15 years. So we're very particular about certain things and they don't always seem reasonable to other people. And sometimes I'll point them out to people and they're just like, why are you worried about this? But it's stuff that matters. And so I think what like we really look for is ease of maintenance. You know, some of the things is, you know, you get some of these old houses with old plumbing. It might not seem like that big of a deal, just 10 years difference between this house and the house next door. But, you know, it means an entire plumbing renovation if you don't want to deal with plumbing issues for the next 30 years. Landscaping. I mean, sometimes we'll walk up to a house that's a great flip And my husband will just say, nope, (laughs) not doing it because I'd have to cut out 30 trees and the neighbor's trees are an issue and everybody's trees are an issue. And we're going to deal with this constantly. Um, So it's sometimes it's little things like that that'll make or break an investment opportunity. And sometimes I think maybe we're too picky, but I also think we now have a very solid portfolio of very easy to maintain homes Mm -hmm. that, yeah, we maybe could have gone faster. Maybe we could have picked up more properties. Maybe we could have done more projects, but to sit back and say, okay, but I know this one's low maintenance and we'll, you know, we've not sold really anything yet. Cause we just kind of love to buy and keep, but definitely the ones we got early on are the ones that we're going, okay, if we want to get rid of anything, we're going to get rid of this one because you know, it's been more of a headache, you know, more constant issues. So when I talk to my clients, especially it's like, Hey, this is not wrong. You know, you want to buy mobile homes like that. You can make a lot of money doing that. Mm-hmm. Here's the issues. Here's the good and the bad that's going to come with it. And if this outweighs this, then go for it. This is perfect. You're going to make money. This is what you're passionate about. Or maybe, you know, some people love dealing with lower income families and they want to be, you know, somebody that helps in that situation and provides low cost housing. And I appreciate those people. Like Mm -hmm. in some ways I feel, you know, bad that we don't, we just kind of focus on like not high end rentals, like Richie Rich, you know, but we focus on kind of like the middle income family homes that, and it does, it requires a lot more due diligence when you're choosing your tenants, you're probably going to have longer vacancy. We do make less cash flow than the property next door that we could have picked up with bad plumbing. But our hope is that in 20 years, we're thankful that we didn't, you know, do that because we don't want to be dealing with plumbing issues for the next 30 years or whatever it is. So I think that's kind of one of the things. And like I said, I always just really hounded into my clients. They say, well, should I do this? Should I do this? And it's not a matter like, I'm not going to tell you, you should or should not do this. But I will tell you in my experience, this is how this plays out. This is how this plays out. Which option do you like better? Right, right. There was a house that we bought like 
2011 and it was a foreclosure and it was a great yeah. house. It had had a lot of renovation, but it was a 1900s railroad house. And that yeah. house is currently on the market for quadruple what we paid for it. Oh, wow. That's um, awesome. And that's amazing, but it's yeah. not my house. I sold it. I sold oh. it. I sold, <laughs> oh, I sold it. And you're like, why'd I sell it? I mean, it's just <laughs> painful to see it. I mean, we lived there three years and, you know, sold that house and turned it into the next house. But it was one of those things that we were really processing. Should we keep this as a rental house? Because we had a really, really great renter in there that literally would stop us at the door and say like, they ate on the floor, like, like, Asian folks do. They yeah. sat on pillows and ate on the floor. So their floor was clean enough to eat on it. And so I was thinking I was in love. I could not have yeah. got a better renter. They were taking such a great care of the property, but the house was as such that being the age of the house that it was, that it was in that perfect equilibrium of, of it just being a happy old house that if something yeah. were to go wrong, how you be just big. tip the whole thing out of equilibrium and it's going to be a sure. massive, massive renovation. Yeah. So that was hard. Yeah. It's still it hard. frustrating to see it on, on the market for as much as but it what is. What did you do but... with the money that you took? And who knows, you know, you, yeah. got, you really got to look at opportunity costs and exactly. yeah, that's why there's no right answer. You probably exactly. you know, take it back and hindsight's 2020, but yeah, you know. it worked out. Okay. It worked out yeah. okay for us, but yeah, yeah. That's awesome. uh, so Jackie, do you and your hubby have like a checklist of things that you, every time you walk into a potential property that you're like, are hard no things for you guys and your investment opportunities that you're just like, won't deal with that, won't deal with that? You know, kind of. Yeah. We've definitely gotten to a point where like a garage, maybe not a hard no, but it's been our experience in Montana that if you're going to rent a higher end home or you're going to ask top dollar, there's certain things that you need to have. And a garage is usually one of them. Also, mm -hmm. we allow pets and we've done really well with pets. And so a fenced yard and a nice yard, not a nice yard, you know, a low maintenance yard, but a yard is something that we really try to look for. We also, you know, because we're renting again, kind of to this niche of, you know, usually kind of business professionals and families and stuff like that, usually at least three bedrooms is kind of where we've landed three bedrooms, two bath and a garage is probably our kind of sweet spot. We do buy in nicer areas. Doesn't have to be, you know, like a brand new subdivision, obviously or anything, but midtown or in Billings, you know, kind of West end or Heights or whatever, but just kind of nicer locations where families can feel comfortable. You know, we've had calls before where it's like, Hey, like we just don't feel comfortable here. We're moving out and I don't ever want to be in a neighborhood where people feel like, you know, a single nurse or something moves here or something and they just don't feel comfortable. Yeah. So I think those are kind of our big, like we kind of do have our, we'll look outside of our box, but it's just so nice to kind of have a box where everything fits pretty nicely in there. So, you know, every time it's kind of copy and repeat. I mean, we've bought our last two flips. You almost could have dollar for dollar done them. We knew exactly when we saw the last one come up that we can make this work. And we ended up offering maybe even a little high. It was a multiple offer situation where we had to guess, but we knew exactly what that project was going to cost us, what it was going to appraise for, what it was going to rent for, because we had just done it, you know, a few blocks away. And so staying within that wow. realm of expertise was really helpful in that situation. So yeah, I guess kind of, we do have some, like I said too, there's things that my husband will just walk out the door, but I'm not dealing with this because it's like <laughs> access issues. Like he is a really big stickler for where he can park his trailer because for, you know, probably three months, they're going to show up every day with two trailers, two trucks, two trailers, all their equipment and have maybe right. subs there. And he's like, it's not a headache I want to deal with. I'll wait. I'll buy something else so that I know I can get my truck and trailer in here right. and, you know, have a comfortable work environment for the next four months. So yeah. We looked at a condo in Bozeman to purchase as an investment property. And we were looking like really hard on these particular units. And then my husband got asked to do some handyman stuff for a realtor friend in that same complex. And he came home and he said, absolutely, positively will not. He had to yeah. park his job trailer like three blocks away. And yeah, it's a big deal. All of his tools and and all yeah. the units were so close together that you could only get like a compact car in there let yeah. alone a pickup yeah. with a job trailer. So yeah, it's amazing 
like the husband perspective, they see things differently than we yeah. do. It's so great to get another set of eyes on things that somebody else might see potential yeah. issues. For sure. Uh, plus your potential renters could be a working a, yeah. a working guy that's got a job right? trailer or they've got a horse trailer. Shoot, we always had a horse trailer everywhere we lived. We had a horse trailer. Sure. Even when Where we lived at the trailer park, you know, we were <laughs> trying to figure out where to park our horse trailer. So yeah. Yeah. it's a thing. So that's really yeah. smart. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> that's awesome. So what I love about you, Jackie, and, you know, I feel like that from the first time I met you, I've just thought that you were so incredibly authentic and you just consistently pursue excellence. And when I was putting these things together to ask you, I was really thinking about the tortoise and the hare thing. And there, you know, are so many realtors out there that are just like, you know, $50,000 in marketing budget. And I'm going to be the queen of social media. And you've just like consistently rolled the ball, consistently rolled the ball, showed up every single day and you've built a phenomenal career. So you're not a flashy look at me type of realtor. So tell us what is it that has been the most fruitful way for you to build your referral network and get business? Yeah, I think, you know, you had that question I had to think about for a little while, but I think the biggest thing is like when a client comes to me, I really feel like, and it sounds cliche, but I'm not selling them a house. I'm selling the 10 or 20 or 30 people that they tell about, mm. tell about me as a, a house. And so, you know, when they come to me and they say, oh, you know what? Hey, thanks for all your advice. Thanks for the hours you showed us houses and sitting down with us and walking through, you know, first time home buyer, we're going to buy my aunt's house. It worked out. It landed in our lap and we're so excited. And I just say, that's awesome. I found you a home. Like that was my job. You got a home. And then they, you know, they'll you inevitably say, we want to pay, like, we want to, we, how do we, I feel so bad. Why you helped us so much. And I just say, just tell everybody, like tell the 10, 20, 30 people that you talk to, because if three of them buy a house, you've paid me triple what I would have made with you. And I just like, my husband, like, like laugh at me because a check will show up after dealing with somebody for, you know, six, seven, eight months, a hard deal. The check will show, oh yeah, I got paid on this one. Like, you know, the check is not, again, it sounds cliche, but I really, something I've been thankful for is that I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. You know, we've worked really hard to pay off debt and that kind of stuff to the point where the paycheck goes in and I appreciate it. I'm thankful for it. And obviously I need it to, you know, build our life. I, you know, it's not like I want to work for free, but it's not the goal. The goal is to sell them a house and then bonus, I get a paycheck at the end. And I love what I do. So it's been really nice to just feel like if I just take care of these people, if I just keep doing the right thing again and again and again, then they do tell their friends. And I do end up with more transactions. Like I said, the machine's rolling. I can't stop it now. I've Sometimes I joke with my husband, I'm never going to be able to retire because whenever I would get anxious and, oh, you know, I'm not very busy right now. And right. I'm never going to sell a house again. <laughs> I'm done. Real estate's <laughs> over. Nobody's <laughs> calling me. Then the next day I know I've got, you know, 10 people and my husband's going, Oh my gosh, you're so busy again. You need to calm down. Like, we want to go hiking or, you know, we want to go do this. And so like, yeah, yeah, just kind of that, like the people that are on your book right now, I don't, you know, obviously you have to market, you have to do what you have to do to promote yourself, but that's second, you take care of the people that are sitting right in front of you today, take really good care of them. And that, you know, it can't help, but then it turns into more business. I love that. Yeah. That's what I love about you. It's not like be the queen of social media, you no. know, have your yeah. name on every park bench, you know, and oh. I was asked to do some very expensive marketing. And I was after all the years that I would have done it. I would have normally spent the money yeah. and done it because it was a, you know, it's very much like a fancy you know, kind of look at me, but all it is, is brand recognition, but it's a pay to play. It doesn't make you good at your job. And right. when somebody's looking for an amazing realtor, they're not just like, oh gosh, let me go find yeah. this beautiful magazine. Cause somewhere in there is going to be a phenomenal realtor. Yeah. <laughs> right. A phenomenal and, lender. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like I had to do that at first. You know, I did yeah. some just face ads, but then once all my friends and family saw me in there and they're like, oh, she's legit. Mm -hmm. Then I was done with it because that's the only people I really want. You know, it's, nobody's going to yeah. remember just a random realtor, really. It's when you know somebody and then they're like, oh, she's yeah. in a newspaper. Like, oh, she really is a realtor. I felt yeah. like that was kind of the purpose of the random marketing. So, yeah, once that was done, it was like, no, nah, I don't need to do this anymore. I'll still do, you know, Facebook here and there. But yeah. yeah. 
No, I agree. I think it's really important to do. You have to put your name out there. You have to get so that people can, you know, correlate the two, but you know, your name and what it is that you do, that has to be, you have to start out there, but I'm grateful that at this stage in the game, that that's not what I have to yeah. do because trying to be yeah, a movie star, it's not really my yeah. job. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, do I want more business or do I want to just take mm. better care of the business that I have sitting in front of me? Right. Right. Absolutely. So if you had no deadlines, nothing that you absolutely had to adhere to a timeline on, what project or task would you focus on right now? I honestly would just exactly what I just said. I would take care of the people that are sitting right in front of me. The ones that have already called me up and are already ready to buy a house or sell a house or whatever. Mm -hmm. I would take care of them. I don't know that I think that's, I mean, that is what I'm doing and that's what I will do because that's kind of where I still want to go. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, that's the honest answer. <laughs> you know, I think that I just, that's a really great answer. And it's one I've been kicking around just like, am I in a weird place in my life right now? Because yeah. and you and I are very similar in age where it's like, I don't really have anything that I need or yeah. really want to do right now. I really just want to do a great job at what I do. Yeah. And yeah. Keep doing it. And at a level that has balance, like, you know, you talked about how you love being outside and hiking and doing the things that, that, you know, so that we have balance and doing the things that we love, but also doing, you know, the work that we do that we also love. Like, I mean, that would be my answer too, is like, I just want to keep doing what I do at the highest level I possibly can do it at. Yeah. And I mean, I've got eight, 11, 12 and 13 year olds. So I'm kind of on the second half of that childhood but they're so fun. We can go, we do fun things. And so for the next 10 years, if I can just keep this where I can go backpacking on the weekend and I can go, you know, hang out with them Mm -hmm. and still have a successful real estate career for the next years, that's the next 10 years. That's right. I'll sit right here. That's totally fine with me. And maybe in 10 years, I reevaluate maybe in 10 years, I, you know, go to the next level or whatever, but want to write a book right now or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But for, or maybe take on, you know, like we've talked about more mentors or something like that mm-hmm. to, to build a team or something like that. But mm-hmm. my plate's pretty full right now. And yeah. I feel like real estate takes up just the right, you know, a portion of my plate. So I'll hang out here for a while. I feel exactly the same. That actually makes me feel gratified and like I'm headed <laughs> in the right direction. Well, it's a hard place to get to. Cause I remember for the first 15 years of real estate. It was goals. It was, what's my one year goal? I want to make more money than last year. I want to sell more houses than last year. And I got to a point where I went to write down my goals. I I really like goals. And I wrote, started to write it. And uh, my husband actually had a really pretty bad uh, medical situation right after my last one was born. So it's been about seven, eight years. Mm. And it was a big wake up call for both of us of just like, what, what else do we want? We have, you know, we're still in the same house we built. 16 years ago, but we love it. It's perfect. You know, it's yeah. like, so it, you, know, you kind of get to that point where sometimes you're like, oh, well, I would love to buy a ranch someday or, you know, this giant property. And so you can set these really big lofty goals, but then it's like, I think happiness is just really being content with what you have. Yeah. And yeah, if the big ranch comes, like, I think if we keep doing what we do, then the property, maybe not a big ranch, but the property we want, I think it'll come, you know, it's just, I don't need to consume my life with trying to get the next thing. Mm -hmm. So it was hard though, to sit down and write goals and not say, I want to make more than last year was really like, it felt wrong. It felt like I was giving up or something. You know, it was like, I really struggled for probably two years for my goals. I really had to do a lot of like soul searching and like what what, I need goals. I need like, this is who I am. I need to have a goal, but what is that goal? Cause it doesn't look the same as it did 10 years ago. Right. And you know, for me, I, I hit my goal. I mean, my goal for years was a hundred million dollars in production and we hit it. And then after, after, you know, that year and doing that and reevaluating, well, number one, the market shifted. So let's, let's have goals that are something that's not going to leave you deflated at the end of the year. Um, There's just simply less transactions to be had. And there's still only a million people in Montana, right? Um, You know, so there's only so many that you can do, but that's was has been my process too, is like what redefining what happiness looks yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not a thing, it's a lifestyle. And right. you know, for me, it's drinking my coffee in the morning, watering my garden. 
listening to my yeah. podcast. Like I yeah. love that. If I could yeah. start my morning every single day in my garden with my coffee and my podcasts, I could just die happy. So yeah. you know, yeah. and end the day every, every evening at home and not being traveling all the time. You couldn't get any better than that. So yeah, that's I awesome. think goals are great to start with because they get you kind of headed in the right direction. Yeah. And I know, and I know you're the same thing too. It's just like, if you put that goal out there, we seem to be really successful in making it happen. I'm very careful into what I speak as to something that I say out loud because I'm really good at speaking it into existence. And yeah. so I better be darn sure that it's what I want because um, right. it tends to happen that way. But yeah, yeah. life is different that's now. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's better. It's good though. I like it. It's good. Yeah. My son's 14. So we're just starting driver's ed right now. Oh uh, yeah. He just got his first pickup. So I mean, I want to be here. I want to be present. Yeah. I want yeah. to be a part of this. So that means for we're sure. just gonna, we're just going to hang. <laughs> yep. We're just going <laughs> to hang awesome. for a while. Yeah. So tell me, like we kind of touched on it a little bit, but 10 years from now, long vision, yeah. you know, your kids are all graduated. You're out and about, you know, just maybe doing real estate. Do you and your hubby have like, you mentioned a ranch, you mentioned some property. What do you think? I mean, it doesn't sound like you're going to stop working like me. I mean, I, what else yeah. would we do with ourselves? Like, right. What does the yeah. long vision look like for you for success? Yeah. Like I said, I, just the status quo for now. And then it's just, it's kind of funny the way it just kind of evolves and you just kind of fall into your new roles. I do one of the things you've kind of talked about, and it's been rumbling in my mind for a long time. It's one of those things that maybe I need to speak it into existence is I would love to find a mentee, somebody to show houses, when I, you know, out backpacking on the weekend, but also somebody that I can take what I've learned and, you know, what I love to do and help somebody else get rolling because it is, it's been such a wonderful career for me. And I would love to share that with somebody else, but it has to be somebody that truly wants it, that I feel like has the same vibe and energy and you know and is going to treat it the same way so that's something that I'm not necessarily seeking but waiting for it like a lost puppy see if you know if it's the right person shows up I think I'd be ready to to do that I also like I said I love investors I love sharing that passion for real estate and just kind of the lifestyle of like you know growing that so finding a way to focus on that I kind of mentioned before investors are hard because they can be very time consuming, wanting to look at every, you know, like us just throwing properties out the door because there's too much landscaping or, you know, something like that. But I love them too. So finding somebody that has that drive and motivation on their own, but that I can kind of walk alongside. So I've been kind of playing with the ideas of how I can take that and do its own thing with it. It would still obviously be a realtor, but kind of build a business around that. So it's kind of been on the back burner, but like I said, for the next, I, like almost exactly 10 years, it's kind of going to be all about what I've got going on now and my kids. And then I really hope then to reevaluate and see, okay, this is how things have changed and where do I want to take it from here. Well, Jackie, I knew this conversation was going to be amazing and it absolutely was. This was really fantastic. I really you. appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. Ah, thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of the Success Realtor Podcast. Just as a reminder, I'm the producing branch manager of the Wood Team at Hometown Lenders. What we are known for are three things. Number one, we close on time. Number two, we keep our realtors in the sales seat at all times by keeping them updated on their current transactions so they feel confident to go get the next one. Number three, when you entrust us with a lead, we follow up on that lead until they buy, fly, or die. Leads are never lost to our lack of follow-up. Our number one priority is for you to earn more money in commissions so that you can improve the lives of your family, community, and in turn, our country. So can I count on you for that next buyer lead? I would love to work with you too. Also, if you're interested in being a guest on the podcast, please just reach out to my office. All right, we'll talk to you when you call in and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Realtor Podcast. Bye-bye.